traditional knowledge should have been happening all along because it's actually part of the treaties and the only way that traditional knowledge can be part of water governance is if Indigenous peoples are there at the table, First Nations are there at the table. It shouldn't be an extraction from communities to then put it into a system that we know is not working. So they said we need to be part of water governance, our sovereignty, treaties, our authority and jurisdiction needs to be recognized. Um, and there needs to be a role for women. Uh, so that was what a lot of the, the teachings speak to, that, that women are the, are the life givers, and that's, that's the first thing that we experience as humans, is that we're actually living in water. And women are the ones, uh, women are the ones who have give birth, and they're the ones who are, have the responsibility to speak for water. Everyone has a responsibility to take care of water, but women are, have the responsibility actually to be leaders, uh, and have been denied that through colonial um, systems. Climate change is creating very particular challenges now. They didn't think about that before um, in terms of water quality and water quantity and that there, there really hasn't been enough uh, research to, um, to even try to address what that means. And I think that's what we'll probably we'll learn more from. Um, the examples in Peru and in Bolivia and in other countries, they seem to be, have thought about this a, a little bit more um, and what that might mean in terms of how we think about uh, um, water governance and water management at a, at a community level that, that, um, that actually reflects what people actually feel is important and actually um, needs to happen. What, what, what kind of women, like how many women are engaged in management or governance positions that are on boards? And it's not looking good, but I kind of think it actually might be worse in, in Ontario. Yeah. Like I, I think about the public managers, so every, couple, every twice a year they have a big conference, the Ontario First Nations Technical Services Corporation. I think they just have one woman scientist on staff. Um, they bring, t and if you went to that, it would mostly be men. But I don't think, now I want to go back and say, can you tell me how many public managers are actually women? Right, and, uh, and there's probably going to be very few. I don't, I don't even know if there's any. And then how many, uh, how many are in charge of health, which would actually probably mostly be women. So certain kind of, spheres of society tend to be things that women do and things that men do and they haven't um, they haven't come together um, enough to really um, figure out how we're going to deal with that uh, yeah. deal with that particular issue there's a lot of effort into um, into women and stem but there's still a long way to go. Like I, like I said, even with the Ontario First Nations Technical Services Corporation, there's like one scientist there. Yeah. And uh, she, she's having to call, she has to spend, it's that like she, she has her job to do, but then she has to lot of spend a lot of time having to put the time and energy into calling out people who aren't accounting for gender, because gender is broader than women, right? So, and, uh, and women, so, you, so you're always having to put that extra effort kind of into that. That's kind of how I, I always feel like, everyone else gets to do their job, but I gotta do my job and all this other stuff because I also have to be an advocate all the time. Uh -huh. um, so I think like, that's a part of like, when I've been on panels with women in STEM, that's been a big part of the conversation is, um, do we have enough role models and can we, um, and we're always in this position of advocacy all the time when sometimes you, you, you actually have to do like the day job 